What are you looking for when you're trying to find a good business partner? When everything's working, and you're getting the press and the accolades and money's coming in, you can work with anybody. You know what I mean? It's not hard to share success. In any business, there'll be a period when things go bad or they're tough. You want a partner that's gonna be there with you when that happens. Dave Groves is a South Central LA investing legend. By a streak of luck, he found himself on a path to Ivy League universities like Cornell and Columbia, where he studied business and real estate. After a successful career on Wall Street, Gross moved back to LA and teamed up with cultural leaders like Nipsey Hussle to bring wealth back to black communities. Today, he'll share life-changing insights into real estate and business development. This is Assets Over Liabilities or Revolt. Let's get this going. Dave Gross, finally. Top of the top. Long th- <laughs> <laughs> a long time coming, man. For anybody who's not familiar, I, I've been a fan of Dave for a while. And um, as our platform started to grow, I think I forgot what it was, but um, I noticed that he had followed me. So we was trying to get him on the platform. I actually sent him an email yeah. a year prior to that. I don't know if I ever got that email. <laughs> I'm serious. There, there was some talks about the the investment in the casino. I think we had put the article up. And it was like, all right, here comes the response. Oh, wait, he saw it. Let's reach out. And we, we did reach out. Yeah, yeah. But long story short, we developed a relationship. And that was like two years ago. Yeah. yeah. And um, You guys we, actually shot an episode out of yeah, the yeah. Regional Vector 90. That's a fact. Definitely. Market Mondays. Um, so for anybody that's not familiar, Dave is a legend in the game of real estate. It's a very interesting story, and it's perfect that we're doing this here because he's a hometown hero in uh, Los Angeles, but South Central Los Angeles specifically. Yeah. We're going to tell his whole story, yeah. but he's a homegrown South Central LA kid that actually went to New York and worked on Wall Street for 20 years. Columbia University? Yeah. yeah. I went to every New York school. <laughs> Cornell, NYU, then Columbia. Wow. Yeah. Perfect trilogy. So, um, so yeah, so he killed, he's killing the game in, in New York, and then he comes back home. And that adds another legacy to his story because he comes back home, he starts doing a lot of work, and um, he links up with the legendary Nipsey Hussle. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace. And then from there, our, our guy, YG. So currently today, he has over 200 units, a uh, value of over $70 million in real estate. And um, of course, he has the Vector 90, which um, we shot our episode out of. Yep. And that is the co-working space in South Central. And that was started by you and Nip, right? Yeah. Um, so that was a legendary situation. Being that this show is based around culture and business, and it's in LA, no True. better person than to have Dave Gross. It's no brainer. Yeah, it makes, it makes too much sense. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. In that, like, the, the story of, of you giving back to the community, but also to the young artists specifically, and give it, and provide a mentorship and give them other ways to acquire assets. Like that's a huge thing. And so kudos now, to you. For now that. it's extremely important to have you on the show because we've interviewed a lot of entertainers, and it's good. But sometimes you need to see the person behind the camera that mm-hmm. people might not be familiar with because there's only going to be a couple people that's going to make millions of dollars rapping or playing sports. But there's a lot more people that can have longer careers and even make more money behind the scenes mm-hmm. right. in real estate, invest, investing, in business, things of that nature. So let's start this conversation off with where you're from, Los Angeles, growing up South Central, um, and then going to work on Wall Street, going to Ivy League schools, going to Wall Street. How was that journey from coming from one coast to another coast? completely different culture, completely different lifestyle. How was that for you? Well, I had a crazy stop in between. Um, small town, Texas. So I'll just give you, I'll, I'll give you an abridged version of the story. Mm-hmm. So I grew up on 51st in Vermont, which is 10 minutes from here, 80s baby. So me and my older brother who's actually here with us in the, in the studio, three years older than me. Um, so it's just the height of kind of all in LA at the time. Um, so our mother sent us away to live with 
our grandmother's sisters in Texas um, to keep us from, from, you know, just getting caught up. Three year age gap, I'm 10, he's 13. Bro was already kind of caught up. So we get out there, we're there for six months and they send him back to LA. And we were talking backstage, they sent him to Houston and they sent me to this really small town, the town of literally fewer than 500 people. So I'd never been anywhere but LA at that time. I'd never even been outside of South LA that much. So to go to this small town in East Texas, like rural, cows, chickens, <laughs> like it was um, complete culture shock. You know, yeah. it took me probably a couple years to acclimate. And plus I was living with my grandmother's older sister. And so, you know, my parents were young and, and you know, we related. Me and my, my, my older brother related to them and all of our aunts and uncles. But my, my great aunt, she was like 65. So it was like going to a small town, living with a senior citizen who, and this is an important part of the story, she was a former English teacher. Like it was just a lot to unpack. And so she was super, a super disciplinarian. Um, so that was the, that one little thing changed my life. Like being somewhere where there was no, no chaos, someone who was on me like every day, no matter what I did. Um, so I put in my time in, in Texas before, before I'm going to New York. So at that time in Texas, is this where you used to establish the discipline? Because I mean, making it to all these universities is not an easy thing, right? You have yeah. to be a certain level of scholar a student to, to even apply and make it into these schools. So that transition from going from LA to now Houston and somebody consistently being on is, is what kind of principles are you developing at that time? Honestly, the main thing was, so when I was in LA, no one would have thought I was a good student. I didn't even know I was a good student or smart. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever would have put that on me or my brother who was actually really smart too. So what really made, the reason I got to Cornell, like I'm in this small town mostly white, a few black people, I become the captain of every sports team. Mm. Basketball, track, cross country, everything but football. And so they started this program where they just gave this blanket test like in the 10th grade. And then the top 400 um, scores, you got to go to this special school. It was like at a college campus and for your last two years of high school, you just took college courses at the University of North Texas. And so my coach, he found the school for his daughter really bright girl. Um, he wanted to get her out of this small town. And then he was like, hey, he was like, you should do it too. And I was like, what? Like, I'm kind of adjusted. Um, you know, I don't got hoop dreams, but I'm the, you know, I'm going to region, I'm going to state in basketball. And he was like, nah, he was like, this, gun, this is a shot. You should take it. Mm -hmm. I did it not thinking I would get in. I did it not actually planning to go. But then once I did get in and it was like, free tuition for two years. I would graduate high school with two years of college credit. And if I would have gone to a school in Texas, I could have gone to any school for free. And so for me, it was just like, okay, it's a way to, way to free education. And I do want to go to college. Mm -hmm. And then once I got there, um, you know, surrounded by really bright kids and all of them wanted to go to Harvard, MIT, Stanford. And so being surrounded by that made me I only applied to two schools. I applied to Cornell and NYU because I really wanted to go to New York. But had I not gotten into that school, had I had my basketball coach not been my math teacher, had he not been looking for something for his daughter who was exceptionally bright, I'd probably still be in Texas. Yeah, that's, that's that positive peer pressure, right? Yeah. Sure. Rather, rather than just saying, I want to limit myself and go to that school that everybody's talking about these top schools. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be the person that's not being included in it. Yeah. And so now you start working harder and striving to say, all right, if y'all going, I'm going too. I'm not getting left behind. So you, you get to New York and what are you studying at Cornell? Because obviously you made it to Wall Street. So was finance your thing? Economics. Economics was yeah. your thing. So economics and government. Because there wasn't, um, at the time, there wasn't an undergraduate business school at Cornell. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have done that. Because I didn't really know what I wanted to be. I just, every image I had, like I didn't have anybody in my family. I didn't have any you know, nuclear family, extended family that was ever a professional or had a job like that, but I had images from, you know, watching movies and watching TV. I wanted to be a businessman. I wanted to have a briefcase, a cell phone, a Benz. And I knew people who had Benzes and who had Rolexes. 
but they got it, you know, out of the streets. And I, I'd seen enough to not want that ever. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Cornell wanting to be a businessman. And then I did, I found out what that was, you know, over the course of four years, Cornell. Mm -hmm. So working in Wall Street, what did, what did you do on Wall Street? Traded options? And My first job on Wall Street was at Goldman Sachs and I was a, I was a corporate bond underwriter. So I helped banks specifically raise money by issuing debt. Um, I left Goldman to, to start a dot-com business during the, the first dot-com bubble. Then I went back to NYU and got a master's in quantitative finance. And then I went to, at the time, as I was going to, it was Solomon Brothers, um, which is a legendary bond trading firm. Um, so I went there to trade fixed income. So I was trading options on credit default swaps. So options on options for my first five years, four and a half years of city. And then um, the credit markets blew up and I was lucky because I was, I only been at the bank for four years at that time. I wasn't senior enough to have made any of the decisions. So my entire desk got let go and me and another young kid at the time we were young kids, we both stayed to kind of wind down the book of business that we were trading. Um, so I, I survived the credit crisis and they let me for winding down that book they were like, pick your next seat. And so I wanted something that was opposite of what I was doing. Cause what I was doing was really illiquid. It was really, um, really complex, really illiquid. And I was scarred by that when the credit crisis hit. And so I chose trading FX. Um, and that was probably the most, that was the most enjoyable job. Foreign exchange. Had, finance, trading foreign exchange. Mm. Yeah, we got to travel the world, which is something I'd never done up until that point. Yeah. Um, and it was like gambling. You know, every day we were known for taking a lot of risk across most, at the time we, call, we called ourselves macro traders. So we traded FX, interest rates, currency, FX, interest rates, um, commodities, and S&P futures. So as you're growing, right, you're going, these are large investment firms. You still have family in South LA. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, as you're extending, are you reaching back? Are you going back? And what's the perception is like, are you the guy that, yo, he made it? And are, at that time, are you feeling like, I guess survivor's remorse, like I made it out of that and now I'm taking off in my career. I might have to go back to help the people. Like what's your, what's your reality at that time? So I'm, I'm gonna give you, um, I mean, this is a different type of platform and I got a relationship with you guys. So I'm gonna give you kind of the unvarnished story. When I left LA, it was me and my older brother. So all of my other siblings were born after I left LA. So I developed a relationship with them like across time later in life. By the time I went to Cornell, my older brother had already done his first couple years in jail. And so our lives are just completely different at that point. And so, you know, I go to two or three schools and I'm on Wall Street and, you know, he's he's just living a, you know, the street life. So mm -hmm. jail when it comes along and, and hustling. So there's just not a lot of connectivity. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when I did get out of business school um, and I first, to me, started making a lot of money, then yeah, you step up for your family. You know what I mean? So my younger siblings hadn't grown up with them, but I was there, you know what I mean? But to speak about how crazy the two worlds are, this is something that really happened. So going into the credit crisis, like when the most stressful person in a, in a credit default swap trader's life is, uh, you know, this credit spread blew out and this company might default. I'm on a trading desk and I get a call. Like, yo, Sean got shot. So that was my younger brother. That's your youngest brother. Yeah. And so this was the first time he got shot. So I'm on a trading desk and I'm holding the phone and it's like people are going crazy about the markets. I'm like, is he alive? What happened? They're like, no, nah, it's cool. We're taking him to the hospital. Just wanted to let you know first. And so that dynamic, yeah, it was there and mm -hmm. it was always present. So, all right, so you, you're making a lot of money on Wall Street. You're living in Soho. You're living a life. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you're probably going to the Hamptons in the summer. What makes you come back after 20 years in New York, back to LA? A couple, a couple things. So, when I think the pull of entrepreneurship and our culture is so strong, you know what I mean? Like all the models of success we have that we really respect as black men or at that time were entrepreneurs. 
crazy thing is a lot of them are entrepreneurs in, in culture. You know what I mean? Like Russell and, and um, Diddy. Diddy and Dame. Um, they were like the, the cool going. You know what I mean? I got lucky because I, I tapped into Don Peebles early mm-hmm. on. Um, I tapped into Don Peebles and then I always tracked Magic because Magic was my favorite basketball player. Um, obviously, Lakers are my team. And so I had a couple of mental models like of things that I could be and I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I could never leave New York. And when I spent a lot of time um, internationally when I was trading FX, but it's not even like, why did I come back to LA? I never left New York all those years because that's where you had to be if you wanted to be at the height of finance. Um, things that changed my mind, changed my life. After the crisis, like Citibank got bailed out twice. You know, people probably don't remember, but the stock fell so much, we had to do a reverse split, 30 to one to be listed on the exchange again. It was like a dollar. Yep. yep. So <laughs> I had remember. to reverse split to be listed again. Now, what that means is anybody who was at Citibank that had worked there their entire career, and think about people in their 50s, a bunch of 50, 55 year old traders, bankers who are about to cash out. That's done. That plan is done. You know a $60 stock, $50, $50 stock, and you've been receiving your compensation in stock and options on stock for five, 10, 20, 25 years, some people, millions turn to hundreds of thousands, like overnight. I'd been at City, and I thought I did everything right by staying at one bank. Um, I felt the pool of, of entrepreneurship at different times, but I was like, now nah, I'm gonna do it right. I'm, I'm gonna ride this out, become an MD, blah, blah, blah. Stayed at one bank nine years, and you look on paper and you think you got some money at 32, 33, um, and then it, it's gone. And so. How much did you lose? <laughs> I lost it. For me, it was a lot of money. For, for a young black male at that time who came from nothing, like literally, no, not one family connection, no, I inherited nothing from anybody but some debts at some point. Um, having a few million dollars that you think is yours, that felt like a lot of money and have it to go to being six figures. Like one, it's like devastating, but two, it's like, why? You know, I, I thought I was doing the right thing all this time, fighting my, my nature to go and do something else on my own. And so that kind of freed me up. Um, it took me a couple years to kind of figure out because I just didn't want to go. You can't at that point, you know, I'm gonna go open a club or a restaurant. Like I had two degrees, I had 12 years of, 11 years of experience on Wall Street. Had to be something in finance, that's what I knew. That's what my advantage was. But I was like, what business can I start on my own that can become a big business? Cause I don't wanna start a small business. And real estate was, real estate's the most scalable thing that one person can do in finance. Like Don Peebles has a team of four or five decision makers, a bunch of auxiliary staff, but four or five decision makers. And he's building a multi-billion dollar project in downtown LA. He's building Affirmation Tower in New York. And there are other examples of people who built multi-billion dollar portfolios, small teams. So I was like, real estate is the thing um, that I can do. It's entrepreneurial, you can do it from anywhere. It's a really dynamic industry. You can be a developer, a land entitler, you can be an investor. Um, whatever you want to do is there. And so I was like, I got to lock in on real estate. And I did that mid career. So obviously, you're watching, did, you, know, you don't know Don Peoples at the time. You're just watching his moves, watching studying his moves. moves. And trying to figure out how to get to him. Right. And so who, who's teaching you? Do you have a mentor at the time or you're self educating yourself? Because you're going from finance to real estate. Obviously, you're going to know the numbers part, but there's a lot of things you don't know yeah. in this new space. So, like, how did how did you learn? So that that's why I went back to Columbia. So Columbia has a master's in real estate development. Okay. So I went back because I was like, I don't have, I already spent 10 years in one industry. I I wish I had started in real estate at 22 or 23 and had that 10 years of experiential learning. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I can't start from ground zero. You know, at this point in my life, I need an expedited pathway to being able to have big boy conversations. And so I went back and got the masters at Columbia. 
So you got your master's after you left Wall Street. Mm -hmm. How did you start working with entertainers? I know you used to do business with Khaled. Who, who was your first entertainer? How did you get introduced to that world? Khaled was the first entertainer, but that came from working with an NBA play, with, with NBA players. Blue so, all day? Yeah. So I think, I think there's a lot of similarities between your worldview, your worldview, my worldview, a bunch of people. Um, like seeing the power and seeing the, the commercial power of sports entertainment. So when I went to Columbia, they had this, you could do a thesis project. So the thesis project that I pitched was Columbia creating a certificate program for entertainers and athletes around real estate development, or real estate investment and development. And there are tons of mod, like Harvard, whenever you hear like this supermodel, this person got a degree from Harvard, typically they went to like a two or three week, four week certificate program that Harvard has, they have a ton of them. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we should do that. I was like, everyone that makes a lot of money should own real estate. Um, this is a demographic that's underserved when it comes to financial literacy and education. And um, I was like, I bet the actual teams or the leagues would support or partner if we put it together. So I spent my year and a half at Columbia working on that, thinking that at the end of the day, we would create a certificate program from, from Columbia for sport athletes, entertainers. Something happened with some athlete at the time, like beat up his wife or something like that. And it was big. So like, you know, we don't want the reputational risk of that, but I already created a curriculum and I spent a year and a half on it. So I started while I was in school consulting for Lou all day, cause he was trying to go from like investing in single family to commercial. So I started consulting for him and I was like, yo, can you help me with this? Can you connect me to um, the Heat, who he was playing with at the time, or the, M or the NBA? And so he connected me to the Players Association and they were like, we'll underwrite it. We'll spot, they're like, if you'll come and teach it, you know, we'll make this a class offering for our athletes over the summer. And so I did that for three years. Um, every summer I would go and teach like 30 to 40 players, like just this, a, a pretty thorough, but, but easily accessible how do, you, how do you invest in real estate? Um, and that opened up a lot of relationships. And so I'm working with a lot of players at that point. And then me and Lou all are going deep. He's in Miami and I meet Khaled's team. And I started doing a lot of Khaled. So Khaled opens the door to more entertainers. Yeah. And then, so do you transition from Khaled to now entertainers specifically in LA? Is that the mindset? Like I'm going, I'm gonna go back home find the, the, the young entertainers and obviously some athletes here and say, all right, I'm gonna give the game back to my home city. Now, nah, you know, so I, so Cala led to other opportunities. Um, I actually came to LA to help. I came with the intention of helping, you know, one of the biggest in, black entertainment families in the world start a family office. Um, Is that, can we say the name of this? Yeah, yeah. It's Will Smith. Yeah, so the exact story is Will's son, Jaden, started this water company mm -hmm. called Just Water. So I think he got pitched to Lou Wall. Might have come down to Khaled. Um, I invest and I get other people to invest in the deal. That starts a relationship with Will's team and his managers. Um, and it's just a cool relationship. And they're like, yeah, we're going to start, you know, we're going to start to figure out a family office type structure. And so I take the leap. I have a pretty good setup between New York and Miami. But I come because, uh, you know, Will is Will. And um, that's what brought me to LA. How was the experience working with Will Smith? Um, so one, Will's an entity. He's a being, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, um, once I worked a lot directly with him, I just worked at the business of trying to figure this, this uh, concept out. And then the company got started and it was more of an entertainment company. Um, it's it called Westbrook. Westbrook, right, hey, right, right. Yeah. So it became more of an entertainment company and I really wanted, I still want to build that, um, whether it's a multifamily office or an investment manager just focused on, you know, this, this niche demographic. Um, and so I spun out and, and launched Confluent and after about a year and a half of being in LA. And it's crazy because I met Lip, I met Nip during that time period. And I've told the story a bunch of times, like I met him at Lakers game and the next day he mobbed out to the office in Calabasas. But yeah, that's the that's how I got back to LA. All right, so talk about the idea 
behind Vector 90, which is a co-working space. And then also talk about how you had to pivot when a global pandemic hit, which is probably the worst business in the world to be in, especially in LA, where it was everything closed. You got a co-working space, so it's ups and downs in this. So yeah, talk about Vector 90, that whole experience. Yeah. And so once I came back to LA, and now mind you, I'm living in Santa Monica and I'm reverse commuting to Calabasas. Um, so my life is just not around anywhere I grew up. But over that first couple of years, you know, I think I went back almost immediately when I, the day after I got here to see my, the house that I grew up in. And uh, I still have family living there. Um, and I started getting reconnected to family, reconnected to, you know, friends who remember me. I don't necessarily remember them because I was a, a kid when I left and they're older. And um, I, was, I was shocked or I was jarred by the fact that I leave LA in the 80s and it's an anomaly for me to go to an Ivy League school. You know, I had to get lucky a bunch of times. But you fast forward, you know, damn near 30 years and you would just think that now there'd be more people coming out of whether it's the Crenshaw District or Inglewood or any neighborhood like that in South LA, you would have made the bet, it would have been a rational bet, think there are more people going to Ivy League schools and joining gangs or doing street. But no, you know, it was the exact same. The contours of it are different. Mm -hmm. Like the, the, the street involved, it's not crack, it's other stuff. But um, not only is, is, was that relationship, it didn't invert, it might be worse. Mm. Um, it is more prevalent than ever. You know what I mean? It's, it's married to the music, so it's popularized. It's just at the highest level of our culture, which is at the highest, you know, at the top of the pecking order in terms of culture, it's, it's popular, it's pervasive, and it really has the most impact kind of at the street level. And so when I saw that, I was like, there has, there has to be something different that somebody's showing, that someone's trying to do something. Um, and I didn't want to do a after school program. I didn't want to do, you know, the, the traditional nonprofit route or something like that. We say, don't do drugs, stay in school. And I knew I couldn't do it. And so I wrote the, over the first year I was here, I wrote the business plan um, specifically for NIP. Like I was like, I gotta do this with NIP. So you wrote it for NIP? Yeah. No. Cause I knew I had to have, I've been on Wall Street for 12 years out of LA since I was 10, I'm not gonna just show up in Vermont Square or Crenshaw, <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> hey guys, hey guys. I got some I want to the tell prodigal you. child has returned. Come, this co-working thing. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody come follow me or listen to me. Took Good. a 20 year break, but I'm back. <laughs> so I was like, I have to have somebody who has, you know. Ties to the community. People's champ. And that was, I've been, I've been following Nip, I don't know, since his first, the first song that I heard, Hustle in the House. Um, so I've been following him since then and all the moves he made, you know, the, the hundred dollar mixtape, the creation of the whole marathon concept, and then all of his interviews, you know what I mean? I, I still think that's a, somebody needs to do a website. That's just a compilation of his interviews. Um, and that would go. So I was a fan of his primarily because of that, I liked the music, but everything he talked about at a young age. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is the guy. Um, and so I started, it's crazy, because I got in touch with him through my first, through my younger brother, who is actually from Inglewood, but he, he had the plug to Nip's camp. And so before I met Nip, six months before I ended up meeting Nip, I pitched the idea to his camp. I was like, I wrote this. I know he's going to like it. I want to do it with him. But he was, um, he was in album mode at the time. So this is in 20, end of 2016, maybe. And then um, maybe mid-2016, because I, I connected with them, I think, in early 2017 or late 2016. Oh, you you wrote it before you knew him? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I wrote it. He was a vision. I he wrote went, it. Yeah. Specifically, I pitched his team. I was like, look, this for is him. for me and Nip to do yeah. um, in the Crenshaw District. Oh, that's dope. And so you had that vision before you even knew him? Yeah, 1,000%. I met, you guys know Steve-O. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. Steve, Steve Carlos. Sit down with Steve-O. Yeah. Matter of fact, it had to be in 2016. I sat down with Steve-O and then um, JP, who's on his team. I sat down with them when I was working out of, um, out of Sony Pictures in Culver City. So it was before we went to Calabasas. So I sat down with them in 2016 and pitched that to them. 
And how, how was the team, Steve O, Nip, how was they when you when you pitched the idea to them, was it just like they got it right away? Yeah, they embraced it. They're like, you know, Nip would definitely love this, but we haven't focused on the album right now. Um, and I was like, cool. And I was like, once he's done, I mean he's working on a victory lap. So like once he's done, I definitely want to get this off with him. Yeah. Um and then a few months later, him, YG, they were at a, a Lakers Rockets game. So they're sitting right they're sitting right by me. It was one of the things I always told myself, if I ever go back to LA, I left LA with nothing. But if I ever go back, I gotta get Lakers um courtside tickets. And so he ended up sitting right by me. And so at first I was talking to YG because I was like, yo, my younger brother, Sean Mack, they- They, they know each other? They're really, really close. Yeah. Um, he tried to sign Sean a couple of times. And so I'm talking to him and then he tells Nip, he's like, yo, that's, that's the homie's brother. And so they didn't, we'd already talked a little bit, but it made the conversation just flow. Mm -hmm. um, so by the second half, you know, I, I pitched him on, I was like, look, it's a, I didn't say it's a co-working space. I was like, just think if we had a space where entrepreneurs, small businesses came, you know what I mean? And we could plug them in with mentors, give them resources. We could do our own Shark Tank, which was a core part of the idea at first. Mm -hmm. um, you know, where we could bring different people from the culture and we could invest in them. And so he was like, bro, when do you want to follow up on this? And I was like, I know you're in album mode. He was like, nah, he was like, this is important. This is more important than music. And so I was like, I could be tomorrow. And he was like, where's your office? And, and literally showed up the next day. So, I mean, you drew up the Vector 90 idea, but did you also draw up some of the other ideas that you have for him? Because I know that you started to introduce him to other real estate opportunities as well. I know, I mean, that vision for what the, the marathon, what where the marathon star is now, there was a, a, a newer vision for it to be the marathon towers, right? So like, did you have that in mind or is that something that- No, nah, that's something- started, I just started discussing I was, he, together. Look, he blessed me with the opportunity to partner with him and his family yeah. on that. Um, Cause that, that was their, their baby. Right. You know, they worked on, they were there for 10 years. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so we did have conversations about, you know, is it a good idea to buy it? And what should we do with it? And before he even bought it, before we got to buy it at the end of 2018, I was like, yeah, you should definitely get it and you could redevelop it and you could. And so I was like, reach out to the owner. So we reached out to the owner at least twice in 2017 to, to try to buy it, but he didn't want to sell it. Mm -hmm. um, but then when he ultimately did, Nip was like, you want to do it with me? If, if we're going to redevelop it, you're, you're a real estate developer. So that's how that came together. But I didn't come up with that idea. Mm. Um, the idea that we had that I know you guys have a sim, you, I know you guys are thinking about something like this. The mm. idea that we had, I was like, bro, you should be grabbing, you should be grabbing Meek. We should grab YG. We should grab Two Chains. We should grab, you know, Rich Paul. We could be investing in every one of these startups because they want us to invest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that concept. Um, private equity. VC, private equity. And he, and he was super into tech. Like he was, um, he was into crypto, definitely into tech, but crypto early adopter. Um, so he, he already saw the vision. When Andreessen Horowitz, he did that cultural leadership fund. Um, shout out to Chris Lyons. So Chris, shout out to Chris, yeah. Yeah, Chris came and pitched me and Nip, my office in Santa Monica. And um, my response when he left, when Chris left, Nip was like, what do you think? I was like, two, I was like, one, I got two thoughts. One, we should embrace that kid and I make introductions for him. Um, it's a dope idea. But I was like, two, we, we should do that idea. <laughs> right, right, you know right, what I mean? Right, it's right, like, yeah. I, it's dope that that uh, that Ben Horowitz had the vision or respected Chris's vision, but I was like, we, we could cut out the middleman, um, and so that was the first play we sat down and really, you know, put a lot of thought, and energy, and effort to it, and so that was what we were going to do. Yeah, you, you talked about redevelopment. That's obviously one of the things you you specialize in. And so I know at one point you had bid to get another landmark in, in the city, Baldwin Hills Malls. Mm -hmm. And most people would probably think like, why would you get a mall? Retail space is dying, especially since COVID now, we right. saw that, you know what, people didn't want to go back into stores and since people can order online and the e-commerce business has gone boomed, why are we going into retail spaces? But the redevelopment sense and, my, and keen mindset 
you look at this completely different. Yeah. Why did you look at this as an investment that, you know what, I think I could change not only the community, but the entire South Central? Yeah. So we'll get to the economics of it second, but I would have done it, you know, regardless of the economic, um, the compelling economics, because anybody from LA, that's their mall. Either the Fox Hills Mall, was your mall, if you, like back when I was a kid, that was our mall. Anybody that came after me, all my younger siblings and everybody that's lived here for the past 30 years, the Baldwin Hills Mall was everybody's mall. You know what I mean? Like if you draw concentric circles around it and go out two or three miles, every, by every person I've known and loved that died has died within three or four miles of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, that's all of South LA. So it's just iconic. I actually, I wrote Magic Johnson two letters in my life because I love the Lakers that much and I respected Magic that much. So when I was younger, I was like 16 or 17, when he did the theater at the mall, I wrote a letter, I don't know what letter went, I sent it to the Lakers um, to get it to him. Um, <laughs> He'll get it. <laughs> just out in the ether, so I sent it to him, ex expressing how significant it was, for it, which is crazy when you look back at it, the meagerness of somebody opening a, a theater in a black neighborhood was a big deal, a nice theater. Right. How sick is that? But it was though. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? To the Crenshaw district, it was huge. And then Magic did some other stuff, like in Ladera Heights, um, a Friday's and a Starbucks that helped change, not just what was in the neighborhood, but people's thought processes. Like, oh, we could do something like this. And it was big for not just kids, but for adults. So the Baldwin Hills Mall um, was that for me. I'm like, if I can buy this mall, and redevelop the mall, I remember being, you know, I remember being a kid who knew I was going to have a good life at that point because I knew I was going to, a, you know, I was on my way to doing something, mm -hmm. but it impacted me. So I was like, man, if the version of me now could see somebody who talks more like them and looks more like them and dresses kind of similar, and they, they, if you're in LA, they know me and Nip. So I was like, the psychic impact of that is going to be huge. But now let's talk about the economics of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the mall is the heart of it in terms of what you, you see right now, but the city approved a master plan for it going back eight years, 10 years. And so the mall remains and you can build more retail space, but a thousand units of housing, 50-50 um, um, condos and apartments, a uh, 400 key hotel, um, a couple hundred thousand square feet of office space, which prior to the pandemic, you know, the office space would have been killer. Now you could do some other interesting things. Um, so yeah, that that was a billion dollar development. Probably mm -hmm. take, if it's done, it'll take somebody 10 years. So when I looked at that, I was like, you know what? I can do something close to home that I know is gonna have crazy impact. It's gonna take me the next 10 years of my life if we get it and I do it. And I'll probably just be able to back out <laughs> real estate development at that point, just do something else. So um, we spent a year, I spent a year chasing it, different iterations. Like first I was trying to help the guy who owned it before it got auctioned off. I was trying to connect people to him because he's a black guy who owned it. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so I was trying to connect capital partners to them to help salvage it. Talk about, you know, full circle. I bid on it once with Peebles. So me and Don bid on it, but Don already had like his large scale project in LA. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had, it's called Angels Landing downtown. It's a much bigger project. And so it was more of a passion project for me. And he was like, look, I don't want to, there's already a lot of community fighting around it. And so he was like, let's bid on it. If we get it, we get it. Um, if we don't, you know, I got Angel's Landing. I might pull you into that. Um, so we bid, I just wouldn't let it go. So other developers kept being awarded the site, but the community would buck. And then they would, their capital partners would back away. Um, what changed everything, the entire dynamic, if I'm being honest, like post George Floyd, a lot of large institutions, they were like, you know what? Maybe we should rethink our business models because it's the biggest thing in the most critical, most critical resource if you're a developer or investor is capital, right? Mm -hmm. In most professions, there's a saying, you rise to the level of your incompetence. You just keep rising until you get to a place you're just not smart enough to go further. In real estate or private equity or VC, 
you rise to the level of the amount of capital you can raise. If you can keep raising capital, you can keep rising. Now, for most black developers, Latino developers, just other developers, like that's a hard ceiling to break through to get institutional capital, which right. is how most the billionaires we think of, they like, they eat off of institutions giving them a hundred million, a billion, you know? And once you're in that system, you stay in the system. Prior to George Floyd, and I'm, I'm being completely honest, I was probably five years away from getting into that system of having a large investment manager say, we want to write you a check for $120 million to buy the ball in those Crenshaw Mall. Mm. But I got to give it up. Actually, to Nip, this is a true story. There was um, a kid at BlackRock, biggest investment manager in the world. They manage almost 10 trillion a day. Anything in technology, they're involved. BlackRock, they have to invest in everything. They have, yeah. they're, they're the biggest. I'm yeah. not, they're not one of, they're the biggest investment manager in yep. the world. A kid from BlackRock started hitting me up. Um, maybe in 2019 and after NIP. So he was like, yo, I was a huge NIP fan. And he was like, I'm a real estate investor at BlackRock. I would just love to meet late 19, in 2019 maybe. But after George Floyd, he was like, look, he was like, our firm is gonna get serious. We wanna help unlock your vision in South LA. So I was like, remember that mall I took you to? I bid on it before, but I didn't really have the capital. I was riding a shotgun, somebody else's bid. I was like, give me the money, help me get the money. And he got BlackRock to, you know, write an infinite check, basically. Mm. We do with them all. Wow. Yeah. Why didn't it happen? I'll never know. I'll never understand it. I, I, <laughs> I think it was such a, it was a bidding, it was an auction process that failed like four times, three or four times. So we were either the fourth or fifth round of bidding. And I think the, the group of investment managers that owned the mall, they were like, we just need somebody who is going to buy it and not care about the community outcry. And so the guy who actually won, he's a hard nosed developer and they knew he wouldn't blink, you know, if the community was pushing on him. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know we had the highest bid and I had real capital behind me. So all I can say is we did not get it. Typically the reason you don't have black ownership of some of these major assets in black communities. They didn't have the capital, the resources. When you're talking about resources, apart from capital, it's code word for, they don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. But I had one of the biggest developers in the country as my, my JV partner in it. And then we had the biggest investment manager in the world as our, our equity check. Um, so capital wasn't the issue. Capital or capability was not the issue. Hmm. Less. Interesting. Well, one, one development that you are doing is a uh, Westchester, New York, a place that we're familiar with. Harrison, 24-unit residential uh, property. Talk about that. Yeah, it's very different market, very different. It's luxury. <laughs> <laughs> luxury all the Slightly way. Slightly different it's, from um, South Central. <laughs> it's like a three-minute walk from the, the train station there. Um, it's, it's penthouses and townhomes. So every, um, every penthouse has a roof deck. Um, every townhouse has its own outdoor space. Elevators in, in each unit. Um, it's fly, you know, a million dollars a door. But um, it is something, man, it illustrated every aspect of real estate to me. Like I was telling Rashad earlier, ultimately, I just want to be an investor. So a real estate private equity investor. Like I want to cut checks to other people to go and develop or to go and acquire. Mm -hmm. Because when you build from the ground up, it's like a, it's like a marriage. It's like, three to five years, maybe. And that's if it goes right. Over the life of this project, I had everything happen. The first time ever in, in New York history, there was a moratorium on construction because the first, um, the first cases of COVID came from New Rochelle. I was working. He was a teacher, so, yeah. It happened right up the street from my school. So the first cases came from New Rochelle. Yep. So even before they shut down, yep. like we had subs that didn't want to come on site. <laughs> Like, they didn't want to, people didn't want to come to Westchester. And then they had the moratorium on construction. But even after it came back online, you know, you usually you have 15 guys working in a room. You're working on the floor, you're nailing it in the wall. COVID protocols, three guys can work in a room. X many guys can be on site. So the timeline for the project, like this, 
And then I went to business school, never heard or thought about supply chain constraints, mm. lumber. Increase Doing price. everything, everything, but lumber was the first killer. Yeah. But everything just skyrockets. And so we're like, yo, we need, we would have wanted 50 people on site. We need 100 people on site to get back on track, but we can't do it. So all, the whole point is you're exposed to so many vectors of risk in real estate development. Um, and I know a lot of people want to get into it. Not discouraging them, but let me say like over a long enough time, time frame, anything can happen and the longest runway projects in real estate or development projects. So um, it's definitely been an educational experience for me. Now, all that being said, what has happened that, what has happened, and this is crazy. So when it's all said and done, the project's gonna be worth more because rents right. <laughs> have just gone yeah, crazy. Yeah. So inflation has pushed everything, but rents in that market are up. 35% since we started. And so the initial rents that we underwrote, because I was we were being we were being pioneers. Like Westchester County for the longest time didn't love multifamily development outside of like White Plains. Like if you look at some of the smaller towns, they wouldn't let you let you develop. They opened this window where they're like, okay, we're gonna allow some development, and they closed it again. So there's been nothing new in Harrison for a long time. And then Avalon Bay is doing something like big kind of boxy apartments. We're like, no, let's do something uber luxury. People were paying $20,000 on the Upper East Side or West Side can come here and pay 12. Mm -hmm. And we're like, I was like, that's the vision. We're gonna build Manhattan luxury, but in Harrison. And when we first started, those rents seemed like a stretch. How, much, now, how much is rent? 10 to 12, depending on the unit. But now we're, we're gonna blow through that. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So when, when you take on this type of project and you see obviously lumber's going up have you obviously built that in to the pricing of the project do you have reserves and what, yeah, what you always have a contingency you always have a couple of different contingencies and then a bunch of reserves but yeah you can never anticipate no one ever anticipated a pandemic no one ever if we had known lumber was going to be 10x at one point the whole building could have just been steel and glass you know what i mean <laughs> so um <laughs> But again, it's it's all working out because rents, you yeah. know, which is fortunate for developers who built something over the past two years. Unfortunate for for renters in most parts of the country. You said when we started the show, he had spoke about the the hotel casino situation. You said to make sure that we talked about that before. So what's the deal with that? Nah, you know what? So I didn't even realize. I didn't even realize that's how I started following you. Or I don't remember commenting. I just remember seeing the platform, and I, it was something different, unique. And I was like, oh, this is fly. Um, but no, that was a crazy, that was a crazy situation where I learned, like I experienced firsthand, um, just internet madness and media madness. So the true story behind that investment, Virgin Hotels reached out to us. Um, to you and Nip. To, yep, they actually reached out through um, Nip's a and Dallas. Right, because they had seen an article, we bid on we bid on a hotel in Santa Monica first, and we had a bunch of um, entertainers and athletes. And again, it was it was me and Don Peebles were going to lead it. Um, but I was like, of course I'm grabbing Nip, and of course I'm grabbing Luol. And then we had a bunch of other people like, you really buy a hotel? We can buy that. I was like, yeah, we're going to do it. Um, we lost because Blackstone bought the whole the entire portfolio of this this particular brand, but Virgin saw that. Right, Virgin Hotels, it was, it was an upstart. Like Virgin's been around forever, but their hotel brand was re relatively new. And they wanted culture and music to be infused at the heart of what they were doing. They literally reached out to us. Have us come to Vegas to meet and talk. Um, and they were pitching us on investing in a hotel in New Orleans. In where? In New Orleans. New Orleans? There's a Virgin in New Orleans. I think it should be finished now. We were meeting in Vegas at the Hard Rock. We're like, why are we meeting in Vegas? Why do you have us come to New Orleans? They're like, oh, we just bought this. And so I'm like, well, we want to be in this. <laughs> I was like, that's what you guys want, sports and entertainment culture. I was like, that wants to be here. We can talk about New Orleans too, but it has to be here. So that's how it came, came about. Now, Nib dies. I do a tribute post. 
Because I think it's one of the flyest things that, you know, anyone, like to me, like owning part of a hotel, casino, I'm like, that's, that's fly. You know what I mean? Legendary. I've been to the Hard Rock. I've partied at the Hard Rock before. Um, so I made a post. And this is where it comes down to there's um, like corporate America embraces culture when it's convenient or when it's beneficial. Here's what happens after I make that post. Well-intentioned people within culture or NIP fans start reaching out. They start calling <laughs> Hard Rock. They start calling Virgin. Um, and they're like, hey, the hotel that the casino, the Nipsey Hustle is developing. Which one is that? Where is that? We want to we want to So the magazines, the complexes of the world, we want to interview somebody. Fans, we want to book. We want to go. But because of Donald Trump, the NIP and YG, <laughs> you got a whole other side. <laughs> they start calling the Gaming Commission. This gangster rapper, he's, he was building a, a casino. casino. Literally for like a, a week, they opened up. An investigation? <laughs> like, yeah, an inquiry into it. So the CEO, like the Tangiers. So the, <laughs> no, the CEO, Tangiers, yeah. so the CEO of the hotel, not a virgin, but of the specific project, mm -hmm. he issues a statement and it was, um, it was factually accurate, but it was dishonest because he was like, you know, Nipsey Hussle, I, I don't know if he's involved. He was like, we know a guy named David Gross and he invested through a vehicle, blah, blah, blah. So then it's this, people are like, oh, you lying using Nip's name. So it was just the trippiest thing in the world. And so I, I actually went to see the guy. I was like, bro, I could, we got pictures of, of us with the Virgin team, like hanging out at the, at the pool, right? I actually posted them when we first did it. So I'm like, that's your head of development. I was like, why would you say something like that? And he was like, well, I didn't say you guys didn't invest. He was like, we had this investigation, think about the project. And then he was like, you know what? You know, my girlfriend's really into Dr. Sebi and health. Well, I want to fund, I know Nipsey was doing a Dr. Sebi documentary. I want to fund it. I was like, bro, this isn't about money. <laughs> so about, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. And I wouldn't take the money at this point. Um, but that was the craziest. And I've never, I've never addressed it. I just let it go because it was, you know, people were so sensitive and so raw, like, you know, don't lie on Nip's name, don't use Nip's name. Um, and then I let it go because I didn't want any bad, anything bad to happen to the actual project. We were invest, invested millions of dollars into the project. Um, but I think it's just worth noting, like, cause now everybody wants to embrace hip hop and entertainment. And they'll take, you know, the, the upside, the good part. Yeah. but they'll go super corporate the downside and that and that's really why so to shift directions that's why i know what you guys stand for what this platform is about and why i want to do what i want to do like so it's not people just leveraging the culture or using the culture it's people who are actually in the culture like realizing that value and sharing it throughout the culture like we're getting closer to that but it's still like a a weird thing where someone outside the culture sees something a value and says, I'm gonna start this. And they bring everybody in the culture into it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? The next iteration of all this will be, I start my investment management firm. You guys start a EYL VC fund that has, every, you know what I mean? Yep. Well, that's the thing. And I feel like that's, it's almost like an adult children situation where it's like, you're not capable of doing it yourself. Let me build the infrastructure for you and you can come and champion it. Yep. Be an endorser have low level of equity, if Let any. me tell you how valuable your IP is. Yeah. It's this valuable. Now let me protect it. Let me go, let me go protect it and harness it for you. That's what the conversation is. That's what, that's, that's what the music you business is. You are this important, you're this valuable. I'm the person to go unlock it. Wait, why, why, why would you go unlock it if I'm the, <laughs> right. like, the person I give credit to has done it right, um, and that they've, they realized that they were the value and they took that value and made everybody in their, their direct circle like a boss. And didn't make them, he put them in the flow. It's Le LeBron. LeBron. LeBron's kind of the model, I think. And Tyler Perry. Yeah. Tyler, Tyler Perry, yeah. Last thing I'll say, because before, you know, all the corporate plugs are looking at y'all. <laughs> the craziest thing to me used to be, you see like a six foot six, six foot seven basketball player, you know, a god among men, physical specimen being led around by a, you know, a little nerdy guy, like who's telling them when to be and where to be. And he's asking for his money and allowance. Him. Yeah, picking everything in his life yeah. for him. Here's your business manager, here's your your attorney here, like. Is your stipend for the week. Which is crazy yeah. to me.
You got so the the, the Baldwin Hall Baldwin Mall Hill didn't work, right? I wonder is there a legacy project that you see on the horizon for you? Is there one? Obviously, you're doing the work in, in Harrison, but is there one that I mean, because Harrison is in New York, and yeah. I know what LA means to you. Is there a legacy project here that you would love, or you have your eye on now? Actually, so yeah, and and sorry for being um, for being clandestine, but there's there's like a little ecosystem of projects. So three projects that all in different stages, um, but even if only one of them happened, would be transformative. Now, what I learned from the Baldwin Hills situation, I'm not gonna speak it yet, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I don't want any pushback. The craziest thing is, even before it happened, we were getting pushback from parts of the, the black community. Like, you're gonna gentrify, you're gonna do whatever. So I don't wanna deal with any of that. Right. Like, I wanna tie these up um, and execute and then as people see it in here, they see it in here. But um, yeah, there's a couple things that'll be more in my mind. And the, the Bald Hills Mall was was special to me. Like, but what I'm working on now, I think is more significant than the malls. And what I took away from the Bald Hills situation is it just opened up. It opened up doors to other institutional capital partners. Mm. And so it still ended up working for me, not the way I wanted to, yeah. but now I can sit down with you know, you pick the top 10 um, real estate, private equity funds, the largest investment banks in the world, and I can pitch them projects. And so it, it got me to like, a, it pushed me forward like five years in my process. Yeah, another level. Yeah. Let me ask you this. You, you said something about a boat cruise off camera. <laughs> Very interesting story. I mean, I, I've seen, listen bro, I've seen the value and the power of culture. I've been a native hip hop listener, lover my whole life. Like all of my earlier influences were hip hop. Um, and what, I, what I'll say is once I started making money, shout out to Dame, who uh, I know you guys work with, I always put my money back into the ecosystem. Um, put it in the streets. That's I've, what Dame says. I've I've always back put it back in the ecosystem. I've always invested in black people. Um, and beyond that, black people who who were, you know, I've invested in people who had records, who were like, bro, I was scared to tell you. I was like, oh, I know you had the record. I looked into you before I sat down with you, but I'm not seeing that, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing your idea. Um, but talking about doing something in the culture, which I think should be done again, I think I wanna do it again. We can actually talk about it. When the year Ja Rule had that fire fest. Fire fest. Yeah, so the legendary fire legendary fest. Legendary fire fest. <laughs> three documentaries. <laughs> Multiple documentaries. <laughs> Incredible <laughs> documentaries. Three, yeah, so I said three of them. Like they all, and they're all good. <laughs> I actually had a, I did a music festival cruise that actually worked. Um, but it was so similar to the, to the fire fest. We had a cruise that was going, we went from Miami yeah. to the Bahamas. Performances on this little island, private island in the Bahamas. Um, the same exact thing as fire. Huh? Same exact thing. <laughs> so once that started really picking up and percolating, I actually told my partners, like, yeah, this is gonna be bad, watch. And they're like, nah, we actually have, we had future. So ours was, was just culture. Ours was, we knew our target market. <laughs> ours was future. We had the Migos when white t-shirt was the biggest song in the world. Um, ASAP Rocky, Lil Wayne, yeah, Khaled, DJing. And then we had like, who do we have? Uh, we had some like Vixen, um, Amber Rose come host, like be a host or something like that. Perfect. Yeah. But we had it, bro. It's the same fire, yeah, it's the same as fire We, we had it, listen. I remember this. We, we, um, we had TEDx style talks. So actually Nip, Nip came um, and I was like, Nip, I don't even want you to, to, to come and perform. I was like, I want you to show, show these people, you know, what we're on. And so he came and, and he, he brought the kid Idris and he talked about the, the store. Um, he talked a little about the fun we wanted to start. So it, it was fly, but we got killed because of the Ja Rule. Like every sponsor we had, you had to think Khaled was one of the most marketable people in the world at that time, which is one of the reasons we did the cruise. We're like, we got Khaled, you have every sponsor who can't do a deal with Khaled because it's conflicted out. They can do it with the cruise and they can get their Khaled, you know, drop off. Everybody backed away. But we still went out, we did it, it worked. The next year, uh, my partners did it again. They had Post Malone the next year and Cardi. But yeah, I did the first one. 
It was a documentary. We have all the, we have a lot of footage too. Ah, yeah. We have uh, actually Complex was our, our media partner. I don't know what, I, I gotta go find it. Yeah, we gotta show that side so, so it can be done can the be right done. way. I'm, I'm only bringing it up because it should be done. All those festivals that, again, culture, monetizing culture. Yeah, no, no tents and cheese sandwiches. Yeah. It's untastefully. <laughs> <laughs> Before we leave, I gotta ask you something that's become a global landmark. Um, Crenshaw and Slauson, that's something that yeah, that's kind of the best way to describe it. It's a global landmark at this point. That's where the Marathon store was. I know that you're obviously involved in a project. Can you talk about what you think, what you would like or what you think the future of Crenshaw and Sloss in that intersection strip mall situation? Yeah. So, you know, really it, it's, it's such a sacred space. Like, cause everyone, people make, people to this day, there's somebody, there's, 50 people who went to that site today who made a, a pilgrimage it's from like a pilgrimage mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to go to go pay respect and to pay homage so what I'll say is it'll always be you know his family's um, asset what it'll ultimately be you know it'll, it'll, it's a function of what the family thinks is the highest and best use um, I know that there's a lot of people who are concerned or afraid that we left and nothing's gonna happen no, that's not it at all you got to realize when so, you know, there's not many nip like figures in LA. There was Kobe, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. You had to pick two or three people that were beloved by all of LA for different reasons. Kobe, nip, you know, Snoop really isn't from LA, but Snoop is, is beloved like that. So that losing nip hustle, there's so much emotion around that. Like the world, the business around him, you know, just naturally ceases for a while. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about shoring up the base and the legacy and making sure that's solid. So we didn't even think about the mall for like a year, what was gonna happen. We just wanted to keep people going to it safe and make it cool. Um, and then the world changed so much because um, we'd started working on the plans for it. We already engaged architects. We had you know, land use attorneys working before the day we closed. We already had stuff moving. Um, then it just stopped. And I'm glad it kind of stopped because, you know, before we were thinking the, as much housing as possible should be there and my sure it should be housing, but it'll be something. And so that this community of people who love NIP worldwide, something dope that's worthy of his memory will be at that, that space. And regardless of what's going on in the Crenshaw district, land prices and everyone's afraid of gentrification, that, you know, that parcel will not be gentrified. Let me ask you this. Real estate, you're a real estate guy. Real estate's at an all-time high. Stock market is down. Crypto is down. Real estate's still rising. It hasn't really slowed down since the housing bubble. Um, what's your thoughts on the real estate market in general? Man, it's um, actually multiple layers of nuance to that question because... There's just so much going on right now. Um, a war that could, you know, that could spark a longer standing um, global kind of flare up at the start of inflationary cycle. Where rates are gonna rise significantly over the next 18 months. So all those things should just be bad for real estate. And it is like the reason real estate has just risen since the, the crisis is because of incredibly low interest rates. So all assets benefit, but especially assets that are driven by leverage, where you can lock in 10, 20, 30 year leverage at really low rates. That's why that's why real estate is up here. So if that was good for real estate, rising rates are gonna be bad, but it's a relative situation, right? So if if I'm scared that all asset classes are gonna get smacked, what's the best place to be? And so there's some pockets of real estate that are more attractive in an inflationary environment than stocks, then I don't even know how crypto, no one knows how crypto is gonna respond through an inflationary cycle. We're gonna see it now, but any real estate asset that has short-term leases you can reset should benefit. So multifamily is gonna benefit. Um, Industrial and stuff like that is gonna be fine. It's gonna be, it's gonna benefit. 
And apart from like people looking for an inflation hedge, there's just a structural imbalance in the housing market in the US. There's not enough housing that's been built, mm -hmm. not enough affordable housing that's been built. So it'll take a decade of building to fill that gap. So parts of real estate are gonna perform really well. Some parts of real estate, like would you wanna own a mall right now or any retail, retail heavy development where if we have inflation and we have a slowing economy, so stagflation, is retail gonna benefit? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, any asset that has long-term leases where the escalations, you can't bump them up. Are they gonna benefit? Mm. But some parts of real, real estate will benefit. Yeah, I mean, you come from, obviously real estate is your focus now, but you come from Wall Street. And so I'm wondering, knowing all those things, obviously, are you investing also on the, in the investment side? Are you investing in companies, Home Depot, right? Because we got to get the lumber for somewhere, or, or Lowe's, or Caterpillar, yeah. or Lennar, like all these companies that pretty, are, you need them to build real estate. Are you still investing on, in, that, in the stock market as well? So here's... Um so I took everything out of the stock market in 2018. I put on a couple of thematic trades since then where I put on a big trade around a very focused theme and I'll, I'll see if it works or not. I'm probably gonna start investing in the stock market for the first time over the next couple of years, mm. depending on how this plays out. Like making outsized returns and in investment comes from buying things when they're price dislocations. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can buy high and sell higher, but that's if you're actively trading. You know what I mean? That's a momentum trade. Right. So I don't have time to focus on the stock market every day like that, like some people do. So I'm excited to buy high quality assets. Um, it's some of the, the basic names that everybody should own. I'm going to be buying them now. Right. Um, and I do, I do invest a lot in alternatives. So um, a lot of VC stuff, I, I'll keep doing that. But I think... If you have dry powder, this is a great time to, to kind of be watching and seeing what you can get into. All right. So let me ask you this before we wrap. Everybody talks about real estate. We talk about real estate on our platform a lot. And um, there's still a lot of people that are not fully educated or not might not have purchased their first home or their first investment property. Um, what is some advice that you can give to somebody that is trying to get into real estate for the first time? Here's what I'll say, because there's it's a crowded, it's a really crowded space of people out there giving people, trying to give to people who have never gotten into the space information and, and, and even sell them the information. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a lot of platforms like yours where it's like, now we're gonna deliver high quality stuff and we're gonna give the game away. And, and um, the notion that you can come into real estate with nothing to, to give and be successful that's, um, you know, no money, no experience, no credit. <laughs> Factually correct, but dishonest. If you come into this with no credit, no money, then you got to have the knowledge. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or relationship. You got to have the knowledge or the relationships, or you got to be like in any real estate deal, there's a person with the money, there's a person with the experience, and then maybe there's a person who's going to like be the legs and be the work. Yeah. So you, you got to have one of those, you know what I mean? You got to either have the experience from having done it before, or you got to be the person that says, I'm going to run through a wall to make something work. So the person with the money is going to cut the check to the person with experience. The person with experience is going to tell you, if you literally have nothing, you got to do all the work. That's your value add. That's your value add. Yeah. And so I would say the, so I would say just understand that. Like, yes, you can come with no money, no credit, and no background in it, but you have to know you have no value add in that dynamic and you're never going to have something good come your way unless you just you convince somebody with experience and money i'm that guy you know what i mean mm -hmm. who's just going to not take no i'm going to do everything you need how you need it i'm going to show up every day and and that's how you can get in with nothing the second thing i would say is if you're not willing to do some work you know go watch every earn your leisure video about real estate investment. Very important. Go read some, you know it's what I mean? Advice, great advice. Like just do some work. Like you can, it might come through a class you buy, but that class, if it's a good class, can tell you there's some work you gotta do. You know what I mean? And so a lot of people hit me up and I, I used to have a lot more time to talk to people and, and mentor. And I'll be like, look, 
I would give people two or three books to read. I'd be like, read this book and then come back and talk to me. And they would think I was blowing them off, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was trying to see, <laughs> will you go read this book? Can you build a pro former? Because somebody calls you and say, I'll do anything to, to come work with you and be, I'll, I'll work for you for free. I'll be your, your mentee. And I say, at the very least, you got to be able to do like a back of the envelope analysis of, and that's not very hard. You can, you can watch a few videos, you can read a book. You got to be able to understand the basic, you know, the basic economics of a deal. Mm -hmm. And if I told that to a hundred people, like come back and do that, then we'll sit down and we'll have lunch and we'll see if there's, there's an internship or something like that. Out of every hundred, maybe three or five come back. And I'm like, well, what would this person do for me if they came? They're going to willing to work for free. What kind of work you want to do? If I give you, if I'm like, hey, go and read this or come back and tell me how a pro forma works or come back when you can build a pro forma or write one out. That's what I, that's my test for everybody that hits me up on Instagram or by email. Hmm. So my advice is know what your value add is because it has to be one of those things, the money, the experience, or you're willing to do the work and then doing the work actually entails doing work. And I would say in real estate, if you can't do it like a, a high level financial analysis, you won't spend the time that week it takes to learn how to do that. You don't really want to be in it. So you've had a multitude of business ventures, right? And people approach you all the time. Like you said, you have a barrier for entry. What are you looking for when you're trying to find a good business partner? It took me years to figure this out. What I look for now is someone that I feel confident I can work with when things go wrong. Mm. And um, if you think about what contracts are, all, any type of contract, any business is, is it, stip it, it adjudicates, it goes bad, who's responsible for what? That's what every contract is. Any business, there'll be a period when things go bad or they're tough. Every business I've started, there's been weeks where I, like, damn, I don't know how we'll make it to Friday. You want a partner that's gonna be there with you when that happens. Because when everything's working, when you're getting the press and the accolades and money's coming in, you can work with anybody. You know what I mean? It's not hard to share success. And so, one, I never, it took me a long time to learn how to like be actively mentored, to go and seek mentorship and really learn. So I don't have to, so I didn't have to learn the first person. And I saw every really successful person that I met, and I'm like, really, really successful. Some billionaires, some, and put money aside, just people who, who have achieved. And I'll see a team around them that has just been with them for 10, 20, 30 years. I got the best advice, actually, from uh, Dan Gilbert, actually. I went and talked to Dan Gilbert. And, um, oh, the Cavs. Super Rocket dope Warriors. conversation. Yeah. Um, and he was like, I don't really care what someone's background or experience is if I trust them and I know them. He was like, they can figure it out. Um, and he just showed me how he had people around him that had been with him since, you know, for the past 30, 40 years. And they had different jobs at his company, they run different businesses. And he's put someone he trusts um, in position. And so it's really a character thing. It's a character and we're gonna have contracts. But like, would you honor a handshake contract with me if it went bad tomorrow? I try to figure that out about a person before going in. So mm. That's the most important thing. So um, before we wrap, I just want to go over, can you just give us a breakdown of your portfolio, some of the businesses that you're invested in? Vector 90 coming back. Um, the first location is in Lambert. Second location is going to be Chicago. Um, I own a city block in Chicago, and we're actively writing offers. Um, to buy as much of the neighborhoods around that city block that we own. Um, a cluster of businesses based out of the Bahamas. So um, it's, it's, it's a resort, a studio, a school, um, an elevated Soho house type concept. I actually just sold um, a parcel, like three houses in the Hamptons that I built. Substantial owner in Just Water. I've invested in a number of VC funds and a couple of hedge funds. So that's indirect ownership and involvement. Obviously the Virgin Hotel um, and I own land in a bunch of places mm -hmm. and that I'll either entitle and sell it or maybe develop some of it. Definitely, thank you for coming. 
Um, and yeah, man, this is only the beginning, and we look forward to doing a lot more things together. But most importantly, thank you for inspiring and educating the culture. Like I said, it's extremely important to highlight people like yourself because we highlight a lot of entertainers. We highlight, you know, people in sports, and they need to be highlighted. But entrepreneurs, investors are the future. Yeah. And I don't care how talented you are, at some point in time, your career is gonna be over, but entrepreneurship is forever. So it's important that we highlight the entrepreneurs and investors and champion them the same way that we champion the rap stars and the athletes. Look, man, I, I love and respect the platform. Um, I love the success of the platform because it tells me the culture is moving in the right direction. I see the way it's embraced, so I appreciate you guys having me on. Appreciate you. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It's David Gross. David Gross. That's a wrap.